Hello everyone, my name is Chandra Alexander. I'm the Vice President of Development at Global Fund for Women, and I am delighted to welcome you to our Voices of Equality call. This month, we are engaging with an incredible advocate and advisor of Global Fund for Women, Jacqueline Patenge, to discuss the Zika virus in the context of Brazil and explore whether or not Zika is in fact a tipping point for reproductive health and rights in that country. Before we get started and launch into the webinar itself, I would like to just cover a few housekeeping items for you. If you've not participated in a GoTo meeting before, it's quite simple. Our organizer has everyone muted until the question and answer period at the end. But in the meantime and during the call, you can participate by asking questions in the questions pane and expand your control panel if and as necessary. Your questions will be noted during the call and we will be sure to uh, answer them as we go through and or at the end. You can also use the raise your hand option to ask a question verbally during the Q&A portion and we will have that moderated and be able to invite your voice into the conversation as well. So let's begin. The Zika virus has spread, as I'm sure you're aware, to many countries in the Latin American and South American region. It's certainly creating an opportunity for a conversation, sometimes a charged conversation on sexual and reproductive health and rights. We at Global Fund for Women, along with our grantee partners and advisors, have been monitoring the Zika virus outbreak in Brazil and throughout the region, speaking with folks on their work, their concerns, their efforts around sexual and reproductive health and rights, including a specific focus on maternal and prenatal health, sex education, access to contraception, safe and legal abortion, and of course, more. Part of what we're going to delve into with Jacqueline, of course, is some of the links to uh, the challenges that women and girls face on the ground in the region. Um, and also what's particularly been interesting to us is the uncertainty that the Zika virus has led to with a link to microcephaly and other birth defects. Earlier this week, for example, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention announced that the Zika virus is possibly linked to a wider range of birth defects than previously thought. They've asked for more money to fight the mosquitoes and to fund better research into vaccines and treatments with the goal of having a vaccine by early 2018. As part of our overview, we just want to give you a little bit of a state of the state around the situation. According to the World Health Organization, 18% of births in Latin America are to teenage mothers, and Amnesty International estimates that more than 50% of the pregnancies in the region are unplanned. Therefore, it brings us to think about, talk about, engage in activism around access to information, contraception, and questions about terminating pregnancies when women have potentially few options. Contraceptive use among Latin American women is among the lowest in the world, and emergency contraception is often expensive and difficult to access, if not illegal. Our grantee partners, our advisors, women who are working around the world to provide maternal health care and provide honest medical information are at the center of these critical conversations. Certainly, when we're talking about the partners that Global Fund for Women has, we are looking to women's groups who are mobilizing to fill in the gaps specifically in, spe in sex education throughout the region, helping to teach women and girls about their sexual and reproductive health and rights, and helping them access contraceptives. Our grantee partners are also engaged in work to help women navigate the complex abortion laws and exceptions, as well as to help them find physicians that can provide reliable care and honest advice. Our grantee partners are highlighting the Zika crisis to show policymakers and leaders the urgent need to revisit antiquated abortion laws, which reigns in severity throughout the region. Jacqueline, now I'd like to turn it over to you first with a brief introduction. We are absolutely honored to be joined by you. Jacqueline, you are a longtime activist, scholar, and certainly a former F uh, Global Fund for Women board chair. We're delighted to have you with us. For everyone's information, Jacqueline also wrote one of the first opinion pieces in Brazil to advocate for changes to the country's abortion laws in light of the Zika virus outbreak. Jacqueline is also the, co -found, the founder sorry, and executive director of CEPIA, Citizenship Studies, Information and Action, which is a non-governmental organization based in Rio and currently its executive director. Prior to that, Jacqueline served as, uh, held a cabinet position as president of the National Council for Women's Rights, which designed and implemented public policies to improve women's missions in Brazil. Jacqueline, welcome to the call, and thank you so much for taking some time to be with us today. Thank you. I'm very glad to be on this 
webinar <laughs> on such an important issue. Again, delighted to have you. Now, I just wanted to invite you to uh, make any opening remarks, giving some of the context that I've provided, particularly any of your insights on the current situation for women in light of the Zika virus and what the situation is now for uh, women's groups and how they're responding. Well, I'd like to start mentioning a headline from a newspaper in Rio de Janeiro dated May 15, 2015. And the headline said that health authorities alert that a new virus called Zika is circulating in Brazil, transmitted by the Aedes aegypti mosquito. And the newspaper also quoted the Minister of Health, saying that he was not worried about this new virus because the symptoms of Zika were much milder than those of dengue and because Zika, differently from hemorrhagic dengue, did not cause death. This was less than a year ago, less than a year ago. The connection between Zika, microcephaly, and the Guillain-Barré syndrome was not yet made. So I'm quoting this newspaper headline of less than a year ago to say that one of the elements is that is something very new, very, very new to us. And it seems very, very new to the world at large in terms of this connection between Zika, Microsoft, and also other neurological diseases like the Guillain-Barré. I think that uh, this is very important because while in Brazil uh, we have an endemic situation of the dengue fever transmitted by the Aedes aegypti that for 30 years dengue is endemic in Brazil. I myself, I have had dengue. This mutation of the mosquito that is now able to transmit dengue plus another kind of fever called chikungunya plus Zika really brought to us a sense of urgency in responding and of deep fear towards this new villain, this new enemy. It seems, it seems that the Zika virus arrived in Brazil during the World Cup soccer in 2014. But it is now known that in the French Polynesia there had been an epidemic of Zika with the connection to microcephaly, but unfortunately this epidemic was not duly notified and thus we were kind of a year late uh, in making the connection. We are now in Brazil, as elsewhere, disoriented with more questions than answers. And this uncertainty is increased because of the scenario of the country, because we are living a deep political crisis and uh, we are dealing with uh, cases of corruption involving politicians, plus the fact that an impeachment of the president, not on grounds of corruption, but on grounds of a technicality uh, in terms of investments, it's in course. There is the projection of a negative GDP for 2016. So if in spite of the fact that Brazil has a public health system called SUS in place, and this is something to be noted because this is a country that has a free universal public health system, and this is also a country that has important and solid research institutes and also has uh, database institutes, they are all being affected, all being affected by this deep economic and political crisis. 
So this is the broader scenario uh, in which the mosquito is flying and transmitting the Zika virus. Since you know the information just from a year ago has been quickly updated and dramatically shifted, I'm also interested, and I know others are as well, in the shifting opinions, especially around threats to women's health and the right to abortion in the region. So it would be wonderful if we could transfer a little bit more deeply into a conversation about openings for advocating, in fact, for improved sexual and reproductive health and rights. Well, I think that I cannot talk about sexual and reproductive health and rights without giving you the social dimension of what I would call the social environment of the Zika virus, or the better, the vector, which is the Aedes aegypti mosquito. This is basically an urban domestic mosquito. And that's the environment where women are mostly on, inside the home or on the streets around the houses. So we have some issues that are crucial here, which have to do with regular clean water supply, for instance. And when you don't have regular clean water supply, uh, you do have the problem of stockage of water. And this is a mosquito that needs water to put the eggs. You have the problem also uh, of sanitation and housing and access to health services. What I want to say is that the majority of the mothers with microcephalic babies live in areas with poor sanitation, irregular distribution of water, landing, leading to standing water, and inequality in terms of gender, race and ethnicity, and poverty along with the sense of humiliation that discrimination adds to deprivation of goods, are the key elements of what I'm calling the social environment of the Zika epidemics. And in this social environment of the Zika epidemics, the face of the Zika virus is now pregnant women, particularly poor women. They are the most affected by this perverse effect of this epidemic that is mild in its symptoms and absolutely dramatic in its consequence. So it is the face of the Zika virus today, the most dramatic, perverse face of the Zika virus. It's a pregnant woman in general. And most of these pregnant women are poor women living in areas with crucial issues of sanitation and water. But it is on women, on their human rights, and particularly on their sexual and reproductive rights that you are right, we have to focus when we talk about the Zika epidemics. These poor, vulnerable women with their microcephalic babies, or all women that are now in panic of if getting pregnant, contract the Zika, and then give birth to a microcephalic baby. And I want to tell you that doctors are not using anymore the term microcephaly. They are using the term of the secondary Zika syndrome. And I will explain you why. Secondary, of course, because it's due to a secondary cause in this situation due to the Zika virus. And it is a syndrome that is more complex because besides microcephaly, it also causes blindness, it causes problems of audition, and through this severe damage to the nervous system, it causes disabilities and paralysis on the hands and feet. So this is the face of the Zika virus. Microcephaly plus all these other defects. The Zika secondary syndrome that is affecting women. And uh, we uh, have uh, now unquestionably 
the connection between Zika virus and the syndrome. I mean, there is no doubt anymore that there is a connection. As Margaret Chen, who is the general director of WHO, said that until proven in contrary, there is a connection between Zika virus and microcephaly. So it is important uh, to have this connection as a starting point and then to ask about women's rights in this context. And when we talk about women's rights, I would like to highlight women's right to health and highlight that WHO defines health as the right to well-being physically and emotionally and that reproductive health is part of the right to health. So we are talking here about a basic women's and men human right, which is the right to reproductive health. And reproductive health has as a basic, a matrix, the issue of choice. One of the aspects of these epidemics of the Zika virus, not only in Brazil, but in Latin America and, as I understand, has also reached the United States through Puerto Rico and Florida, I think, is that, for instance, the health organization estimates that there are about 3 million cases now of Zika virus in Latin America. And in Brazil, about 1.3 million cases. In Colombia, 500,000 cases. So we are dealing with uh, an epidemic of a dimension that could even be called a calamity. And as the mosquito flies, but the virus, the virus, the virus is transmitted because it flies on planes, on, on elevators, on streets, on buses, on trains, on boats. I mean, this virus, as long as it finds an appropriate environment, will flourish. It is then key to have women's reproductive rights at the center of any public debate on the mosquito. However, this is not happening. We have debates on the vector, the mosquito, which is very important. Then we have huge investments, international and national, on what I would call of research institutes, of infectology, of vaccines that, as you say, takes years to be developed. And this is also very important, it should be happening, but there is very little being said about women's reproductive rights to choose. To choose what? Women should have the right, in view of the high possibility of contracting Zika and of the proved connection between the Zika virus and the Zika secondary syndrome affecting the fetus, to decide freely, respectfully, if or not to pursue with the pregnancy, if she gets pregnant. So you have two stages there. One is to make access to contraception 
possible to every woman in every remote area to have access to contraception as a part of the reproductive rights and this is something that can be done because as far as I know there is not any legislation that would prohibit women to have access to contraception. What you have wrongly is in some countries barriers to emergency contraception that wrongly they associate with abortion. But access to contraception uh, is in most of the Latin American countries a right assured to women. What you need to do is to facilitate the access. Invest in giving women uh, the access to contraception that I would say it's the prehistory, it's the prevention stage. So this is something that has to be done urgently, urgently. In Brazil, there is access to family planning and contraception, even if unequally distributed, but over 75% of women in reproductive age use some sort of contraception. There are many barriers to emergency contraception due to the growing presence in the political arena of a radical, conservative, fundamentalist, religious representation in Congress that unites both the evangelical and Catholic churches. And you have a legislation in case of Brazil that dates from 1940 and that only allows abortion in cases of rape, risk of life, and recently, since 2012, in cases of anencephaly, which is absence of brain, which is an anomaly incompatible with life. So these are the only three situations in which a woman can have access to safe legal abortion in Brazil. However, besides access to contraception, which would be prevention, women who get pregnant and who have had Zika should have the right to interrupt the pregnancy. Now, this should be a main component of the public debate involving health professionals, government, women's movements, and legislators, and the judiciary. And this is not happening. They are still very timid, the voices that are raising that in an epidemic as such, legislation concerning abortion should be reviewed. I want to bring some elements to this discussion. One of them is that what I think should be part of this agenda is that following the legislation in the majority of the countries of the world that have revised their prohibitions in relation to abortion, that the interruption of pregnancy should be facilitated for the first 12 weeks. And as in most countries, from there on, you start to have what you call circumstances in which the pregnancy is allowed, including there uh, the question of risk of health, not only risk of life, as in Brazil, but risk to the health of women, health understood both physically and emotionally. And also, when there is the risk that the fetus might have severe malformation, not only incompatible with life, but incompatible with 
quality of life and also in situations related to social conditions, emotion conditions, as well as, as it already is, in situations of pregnancy resulting from rape and risk of life. And this is how abortion should be discussed, but it's not being discussed. I want to make it clear that it's very important to discuss the right to abortion on a broader range of circumstances, not only tied up to the Zika virus, but to make this discussion urgent in the Zika virus epidemics that we are facing now. Because if we say that the interruption of the abortion will be allowed for women who have been diagnosed with the Zika virus, this will be very complex. Because the symptoms of the Zika virus, differently from those of dengue and chikungunya, are very mild. Many persons, women, have Zika and do not know that they have had Zika. Zika might have very mild symptoms like fever or even very low fever or no fever at all. Uh, sometimes, you know, you feel like you have uh, some parts of your skin that are aching or that are red, but mostly the diagnosis is being made clinically. And then, many times, either there is a failure to diagnose that the women had had Zika or it is mixed up with dengue and chikungunya. And the, the diagnosis on the labs, it's still a work in process in the sense that, yes, today you do have, but at still a very high cost. So most of the poor and more vulnerable women cannot afford the lab test that will for sure give the diagnostic that she has or has had Zika because the virus might not be active anymore. Zika exactly. not, not being active, it has contaminated the fetus. Jacqueline, thank you for that um, incredibly rich context setting for us and, and your deep understanding of not only the virus, but also, as you were saying, the, the landscape for women who are experiencing these challenges is really tremendous. And I'm wondering if you might delve a little bit more into some of the advocacy efforts that your organization, as well as other women's organizations, are uh, engaging in, particularly to think about uh, legislation or changes or activism and information for safe abortion in light of the Zika virus. Um, anything more current that might bring us sort of up to the moment regarding the situation in Brazil? The moment changes all the time. We are on an epidemic. And uh, the epidemic, uh, what you have basically is data. And uh, we do have a reliable data. And what you see is an exponential growth of cases uh, of, uh, uh, you know, possible microcephaly notified. Uh, I have here some data of 5,280 cases, but maybe next week it will be more. Those cases are of possible microcephaly. Uh, and then you have the cases that are confirmed, because you do have to have the diagnosis. And uh, you have the cases that are discarded, because uh, the, uh, my, the microcephaly cases were due to other um, causes, you know, syphilis uh, is also a cause of uh, microcephaly. And so uh, you do have to have this uh, separation. But at the point that we are now, the 
that we already have calls for urgent measures. And what are and what can we who are women's human rights and women's health advocates do? First, to unite our efforts because we are a drop in the ocean. Uh, as I said, the political scenario of the country is at this moment one of a deep political crisis and in terms of the balance of power, the conservative forces dominate the National Congress where it is almost impossible at this moment to uh, really have an effective action. So we are orienting ourselves in terms of advocacy to the judiciary and basically to the Supreme Court because it was to the Supreme Court that in 2010, 2011, and 2012, we have directed our efforts asking the court to recognize the right of women to interrupt the pregnancy in case of anencephaly, as I mentioned before. So we do have already a justification, you know, there is already a precedent of a ruling over which we can expand so as to include not only, not only uh, those defects that are incompatible with life, but also incompatible with quality of life. And then you would have microcephaly plus all the other defects due to the Zika virus. So this Jacqueline, is very important. Yes. Thank you. We have a question from Jessica, and she's asking, is, just for clarification, is the main reason that Zika is a problem in some of the rural and low-income areas because of lack of access to treatment? The main reason why Zika is a problem is because the mosquito, the mosquito is more prevalent in those regions because the mosquito, it's, it's an urban mosquito that flourishes also in rural areas. It's not a forest mosquito. And the mosquito needs water to lay the eggs. And when you don't have a regular distribution of water, you stock, you have water, you know, you keep water in the house. And of course, this is a favorable condition. But anywhere, if you do not have sanitation, you do have the proliferation of mosquitoes. But even in my house, if I have uh, a, a vase uh, with the flowers or whatever, with a plant, and there's this little uh, you know, plate that you put under the vase with water, this is a very favorable uh, locus for the mosquito to put the eggs. This mosquito is everywhere, you know, it's everywhere. And so it is very important to come back to the vector everywhere, but mainly on those more vulnerable areas. I don't know if I responded the question, but it's really due to the mosquito. And then another uh, uh, aspect, it's how information circulates. And you know information and the circulation of information, it's also uh, unequal and discriminates those who are more vulnerable, more poor, poor, have less access to quality information. So information, women who are more vulnerable, more poor, have less access to information, have less access to uh, the need to protect themselves because you only protect yourself in life in general if you fear you are in danger. If you don't know about the Zika virus, you just don't protect yourself. How to protect yourself? Eliminate all the vectors, the possible vectors of the mosquito. Use repellent, but 
Repellent is expensive, so again, you have social inequality as a factor there. I don't know if I responded the question. Jacqueline, I think that's very, very helpful. I, I'm also wondering about uh, anything that's been missing from media coverage. Uh, we've heard a lot, seen a lot. Uh, certainly your perspective is rounding out much of what we've read and heard and giving us specific information about the context that you know so well in Brazil. But if you were to speak, as you will be via this recorded uh, webinar, to more of the international community, are there specific things that you'd like us to know or take away? Yes, I think that uh, in any epidemics of any sort, social communication is key. It is very important to bridge the knowledge that you have gathered in labs, universities, research centers to the population at large and more specifically to the more vulnerable sectors of the population so that they can understand and protect themselves. And I think that good, clear, balanced information is a major component of prevention. And we must remember that access to information is a human right. I think there is a lot to be done in this field. There is a lot of misinformation being spread, and this increases the vulnerability. It is very important to invest in information, how to prevent, what to do, and how to engage also in advocacy in order to have the right to interrupt a pregnancy in if there is any doubt that you have had Zika or if you know it is proved, it has been diagnosed that you have had Zika. It is important at this moment that the advocacy that it's being developed, it's going to be developed with the Supreme Court to be supported not only by women's groups that are always the ones who are there, who are on the streets, who are marching, who are speaking, because this is not a feminist issue. This is a central issue of social justice, of reproductive justice, and of reproductive health and rights that should be on everybody's agenda doctors, physicians, universities. This is what is key now in terms of communication, to engage the wildest, largest, and diverse group of persons in our countries to be able you know, to work on this issue. I have had the, the, the opportunity to speak uh, at the, uh, the US Congress on the Zika virus in March, and I was surprised how many of the representatives, U.S. representatives in Congress, were taking very seriously the discussion on the Zika virus and uh, had uh, uh, very sound information on the issue. I don't know how much is this information being now socialized and spread for, for instance, American population at large. And this is something that has to be done. And this is also something that here in Brazil we are doing. We are engaged uh, in a coalition now of NGOs, uh, of which CPIA is coordinating, and with, uh, unfortunately, a very small uh, support from the Ford Foundation, we hope we will be able to extend, we want to work heavily on the issue of communication, giving information to the population at large and giving arguments so that we will enlarge the field of those who will be committed to both investment in contraception, in reproductive health, to prevent an unwanted pregnancy, to give the woman who gets pregnant, even if she doesn't know but she suspects that she might have had Zika, the right to interrupt the pregnancy, and also for those who decide to carry on the pregnancy and have a baby 
with microcephaly plus all these other terrible symptoms that she should receive the care, the comfort, the support from the state because this is the fault of the government that the Zika virus is spreading quickly due to the permanence of the Aedes aegypti in our context for over 30 years. Jacqueline, thank you so much. It sounds like a lot of the work that you've been engaged in personally, uh, particularly the example that you've given of your presentation to the U.S. Congress, is a success story. And I'm wondering if there are other examples of successful advocacy or mobilizing or interventions that you know about and might share with us to help inspire us uh, in, the, in the look ahead towards what we can do to help spread information that is uh, valuable for people and really helpful in the overall context of uh, ensuring that women have access to information and uh, services that they need. Well, I think that it's important to mention that the UN Women and the UNDP uh, are also very much involved in this uh, Zika crisis epidemic from the angle of uh, women's rights. And uh, I am, my, my, I mean, my organization and myself, we are part of what we would call a situation room that uh, these two UN agencies have set it up involving a huge number of non-governmental organizations from all over the country. And uh, the Situation Room is working in planning uh, uh, joint actions. You know Brazil is a continent, so for instance joint actions with uh, Northeast NGOs, Southeast NGOs, Central West NGOs, etc., plus national directions that uh, will touch both on prevention, on information, social communication, and uh, on this issue of the reproductive rights, plus uh, the uh, demanding that government and health and social institutions take care of these poor women and their babies. So there is a lot that is being done. We are not just watching what's happening. We are incredibly immersed and suffering uh, with what is happening uh, in this epidemics. Uh, a number of NGOs are displaying different actions. And as I said, uh, there is this um, possible action that uh, an, a specific NGO, Anise, uh, along with us, is taking to the Supreme Court. We also have, and this is very good, a group uh, uh, that has mostly doctors and physicians and health professionals uh, and women's uh, high, uh, health activists. Uh, which is uh, called the GEA, a group of studies on abortion that is very much involved. I am also part of GEA. So as you can see, we are exhausted in working in different fronts uh, with the UN, uh, with our own coalition of NGOs, with GEA, in trying to make this issue of women's rights in times of Zika epidemic a central issue of human rights in Brazil and in any other country where you will have uh, and already have the Zika epidemics. Jacqueline, thank you so, so much. We're going to open it up for questions in just one moment, but just to reiterate, um, there are many things that you on this call certainly can do. Of course, continue the dialogue. As I mentioned earlier, the session today is being recorded with all this incredible information, these insights that Jacqueline is providing for us. We'll be able to send that to you and share that, please, with your community, talk with your friends, 
and stay connected with us. There are many ways you can be connected, certainly over email, on social media. Your advocacy, your being an ambassador on behalf of Global Fund for Women, on behalf of the women's groups that we support in Brazil is tremendously important. And certainly you can continue to support organizations such as Jacqueline, such as Global Fund that are paying attention to the specific needs of women young women at this time. So we have a question. I'm going to open up the mic for Katie Grover to ask your question. Okay, sorry, Katie, I think you're muting yourself. We are not, uh, we're not able to unmute you, but I, I do have your question. Um, I believe Jacqueline Katie is asking about, um, about Zika itself and some of the challenges uh, that women face uh, with Zika. For example, if a woman is treated, we don't know if treatment is, is effective or actually yet available, we know a vaccination isn't, um, but is she still at risk of having a child with microcephaly? So perhaps uh, the secondary Zika symptom, as you named it, um, is, is perhaps still something that uh, is on the sort of highest uh, of mind, top of mind list for women who are pregnant. Um, and then what inroads do you know about regarding the specific testing for Zika that women can be apprised of? Well, there is no treatment. There is no treatment for Zika. Um, because, as I said, the symptoms are mild. Doctors will ask you to drink a lot of water and uh, to avoid uh, um, aspirin, for instance, because it might cause a hemorrhagic, to use paracetamol if you have pain, to rest. That's it. There's no treatment for Zika. Yes, there's no treatment for dengue. Specifically, there's not a medicine that you take, a pill that you take, or an injection that you take because you have Zika or because you have dengue. You have to rest, you have to hydrate yourself, and to avoid any kind of medication that can cause hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic, I don't know how to speak in English, hemorrhagic, uh, hemorrhagic, right? Uh, so, there is not a treatment. Uh, dengue is much more severe than Zika in terms of the symptoms. So, what you have to be aware is that uh, the, the crucial issue about Zika is the effects, not the symptoms. And there are two effects. One is that it, it, it can cause something called the Guillain-Barré syndrome. It's horrible, but it's on adults. And it's not as frequent as the microcephaly. And it's also a neuro, neuro, neuropathia. It's, a, it's a, 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 of the neural system. And all of a sudden, you cannot walk anymore. And uh, uh, you have serious problems that might lead to that. And this is very important to identify in the beginning. Uh, because this is the effect of the Zika that you are treating. Now, the other effect of the Zika is microcephaly. You do not treat microcephaly. Microcephaly, what happens is, uh, it is proved that this virus can uh, uh, go to the fetus, cross the placenta, and infect the fetus. First, it was thought that it would be only uh, on the uh, first three months of pregnancy. But now, there has been cases where uh, the woman has, been, uh, has had Zika on, uh, uh, when she was pregnant of six, seven months, and yet even there, the virus has crossed the placenta and has infected the brain. It eats the brain. So one of the, so all the cognitive function that characterizes us as humans is gone. It, it has different degrees, of course, but there is no treatment for Zika. I think I've answered the first question. And as for testing, labs are working and working, you know, to develop quick testing for Zika. Uh, for the moment, 
uh, it takes around 15 days. And some of the tests, only the quicker tests that are now in place, they test if the virus is still active. Because you might test for the presence of the virus, and the virus might by, might not be active anymore, but was active at a certain point and could have affected the fetus at that point. I don't know if I make myself clear, but a virus can have a presence active or not active anymore. Do I, no, do I, I make I, myself understand? Abs absolutely, Jacqueline. Thank you so much for that. And certainly there are many, many resources for folks to delve into if they have other specific questions about the, uh, the virus or, or medical issues. Um, Jacqueline, I want to turn in our last few minutes to a question. Um, there are many of us who will be with you in Brazil. So, so excited about being able to join you later this month, in fact. Uh, Global Fund for Women will be traveling. Um, supporters of ours, um, folks interested in what women are doing in Brazil to help change the, the context for women and girls' rights. Um, and just really excited about engaging in some of these conversations, of course, specifically around sexual health and reproductive rights as well as been, has been mentioned on this call. Uh, maybe some perspective that you might provide around uh, what we might experience, the nature of the conversations at this moment, and specific things that we need to be aware of and or that we can do as people who care about uh, the situation in Brazil. Well, I think that uh, it's very important uh, to have clear that uh, these epidemics, uh, it's not only an issue of Brazil. This epidemic should be the preoccupation of different governments, different institutions, and as it is uh, for the Global Fund for Women, to have the involvement of organizations as the Global Fund that care about women's rights to among the many elements, many elements, because an epidemic has many different dimensions and elements, to make central the issue of women's reproductive and sexual health and rights. And to know that the epidemics, it, it's a threat to any woman, but that currently the women who are poor, more vulnerable, and many of them are black women, are the mostly affected. And so have in mind that uh, to advocate for social equality and to advocate for women's sexual and reproductive rights is a must for organizations such as the Global Fund for Women. And it is very important to do what you are doing, not only in coming here and sharing with us, but also in spreading the communication, the information through uh, webinars and other means as such. Thank you so much. And certainly, as part of the follow-up to this call, we will provide some links to resources, not only on news and latest updates about the situation in Brazil and as being reported by our advisors and grantee partners, but I think what we'll also do, since some of these questions have focused specifically on some of the, the medical uh, knowledge and information about the virus causes and effects and treatment, we will certainly uh, do our best to provide some of those uh, resources as well. Um, I want to invite everyone as we're thinking about uh, you know, the, the time ahead and the things that we can do to certainly have on your radar the follow-up call to this next month on May 11th, again from 12 to 1 Pacific time, where we will, uh, several of the folks on the trip with us to Brazil will come back and offer their reflections. We have two of our board members joining us, and certainly Mr. B. Canyaro, Global Fund for Women's CEO and President, will be with us. So we will have, I think, a follow-up lively conversation uh, based on that trip experience based on conversations further deepened with you, Jacqueline, uh, and based on the stories that we're hearing directly from the women with whom we're meeting and speaking. So Jacqueline, I want to offer you a minute for any final thoughts that you might have for the audience that's joined us today. Well, I think that uh, uh, I hope to have uh, brought some more complexity <laughs> to the issue, not clarity, 
but complexity because it is a very complex issue involving many dimensions and uh, for us who are involved with, with, with women's rights, among this complexity, not to lose the perspective that the face of the Zika virus is, the most cruel face of the Zika virus is a pregnant woman who has had Zika and who faces the fear, the panic, and the torture of eventually carrying a baby with microcephaly and other very severe defects. And uh, that it is very important to give her the chance to decide whether she wants or not to carry on with this pregnancy. Jacqueline, thank you so much. And with that image in our minds, I think we have answered our original question, is Zika a tipping point for reproductive health and rights in Brazil? I think clearly the answer to that question is yes. And we look forward to sharing with you and with everyone else on the call next month more of our experiences from Brazil. Again, Jacqueline, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your wisdom, expertise, for your insights. And everyone who's participated today, thank you so much. We'll be following up with you shortly with links to the recording to share and continue to engage with us online. Thank you thank again. You. Obrigada. Obrigada. Bye-bye, <laughs> Paul. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day.